you know how heavy these things are. Huge amounts of tax being paid by the newspaper industry just on the paper they were buying, which had to be passed on to the consumers and the, the advertisers in, in terms of higher cover prices and higher uh, rates for advertising. On top of that, there was a fourpence duty per printed sheet. So you were paying seven pence, uh, seven pence a pound, weight pound, uh, for the paper, then fourpence per sheet that you printed, three shillings and sixpence had to be paid for each advertisement. So this was a huge amount of money for the government. Newspapers would naturally grow very quickly in line with the demographic growth, but the growth of the press is still very remarkable, but certainly constrained by the amount of money uh, that was being paid over to the government. The tax on newspapers, the tax on knowledge, as it was sometimes called, was a bone of contention for the radical movements in politics, particularly the radical end of the Liberal Party and the same uh, <coughs> sort of agitators who were against the Corn Laws. In other words, the, the reformists, the people who wanted to modernise the country, thought, uh, well, they thought there should be low taxation anyway, that, uh, you know, in, in line with liberal economics, that uh, uh, people should keep money in their own pockets, not paid over to the government, so, so that markets would be created to, um, you know, people with money, so, so businesses would be set up to sell stuff to these people and that that would uh, promote rapid uh, economic development rather than taxing people and the government doing that development. So as part of that general trend of utilitarianism and uh, liberal economics through the 19th century, there's a demand to lower taxes of all sorts, to get rid of the corn laws, um, to reduce income tax whenever possible, and to remove stamp duties on newspapers. So in the period uh, 1833 to 1836, Parliament then had been moderately reformed. After, in 1832, you have the Great Reform Act. And for the first time, the liberal middle classes have got the vote. And so you, you get far more uh, liberal uh, middle class MPs in Parliament. Um, one of the first legislative acts of the reformed parliament in 1833 was to reduce duty, advertising duty and stamp duty on the cover price of newspapers. So stamp duty was reduced in these years from fourpence to one, pence, one penny. That was the tax you paid when you bought a newspaper. Advertising duty was abolished entirely in 1853 just as there was a huge upturn in the economy. Um, so that was like a double positive whammy for the newspaper industry. They were getting lots more advertising revenue and they could keep it all instead of giving uh, you know, huge amounts of it to the government in advertising duty. Stamp duty, which had been reduced to one penny in the 1830s, was finally got rid of entirely in 1855. And the duty on paper was abolished in 1861. So by 1861, there was no direct taxation of newspapers, and there still isn't. Um, newspapers are not subjected to value-added tax, for example, unlike almost every other consumer good. Uh, and, and that goes really right back to the political agitation of the 1830s, that you shouldn't tax newspapers, there should be no taxes on books or newspapers, because that's a tax on knowledge. Distribution by rail is possible uh, by the 1840s. Uh, the first railway lines were really laid down in the 1830s. The system didn't really become uh, very widespread or um, reliable until the end of the 1860s, in, in fact. Now, the data is given in the total number of passenger journeys per year in millions um, and the whole system uh, so, sorry the amount of railway traffic measured in that way peaks in 1908 at about 1.25 billion individual passenger journeys per year um, in 1848 it's about 50 million um, by 
1867, it's in the region of 250 million. So it's five times bigger in 1867 than it is in 1848. But certainly by around about 1870, it's simple and routine to distribute newspapers uh, by train. So you can have national papers based in London that are distributed uh, around the country. Uh, but most national newspapers would have had uh, printing presses to, to, to do their own versions. Uh, so looking now at the London press, a press, regional press that's aimed at London itself and a national press based in London. In 1800, you had four main daily newspapers and they were uh, roughly uh, equal in terms of circulation. You had the Morning Post, the Morning Chronicle, the Morning Herald and the Times. Um, each of these newspapers in 1800 uh, were selling around about three or 4,000 copies. But the paper that was to emerge throughout the 19th century as predominant and dominant for, for a time was, of course, the Times. The reason for this was largely technological. Um, in November 1814, just a year before the Battle of Waterloo, there, right towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, the London Times, or the Times, uh, invested in steam presses, the Koenig steam press, introduced there in November 1814, and that could produce 1,000 sheets per hour. Uh, the previous flatbed presses um, used by everybody in the newspaper industry, you were lucky to get 1,000 sheets a week, or perhaps 1,000 sheets a day. So the, the new machinery meant that the, the paper could go to press much later in the day, uh, because just the process of printing it was slower, so it, it, could it contained much later news. The war was on. Uh, wars are always good for newspaper circulation, I'm afraid. Uh, people want to know what's happening. Uh, and so the combination of lots and lots of war news, um, a growing population in London hungry for that news, uh, uh, the, uh, the Times being able to print newspapers quickly um, meant that the Times cleaned up really, it, 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 it stole the circulation, the aggregate circulation from those other newspapers and became very, very profitable. The, uh, that profitability meant it could invest in even more steam technology, more steam presses, improved forms of uh, printing technology generally. You know that uh, the, the font that you see in most newspapers now is called Times because they were able to invest in casting new new fonts of type um, that were so much better than, than the ones before. And this was allied to the steam technology. It was kind of what economists would call cumulative causation. The investment in the first steam presses, the Koenig Press, had enabled them to really wipe the floor with their competition and win all those readers, concentrate those readers. So instead of having a, a typical circulation of three thousand between five or six papers the times quickly got up to 15 16 17 thousand copies a day um, and was just vastly profitable so in 1827 uh, the time